Amen. Praise God. We're here for another lesson. Uh, we were talking about Philip, the evangelist, and we were really putting a lot of emphasis on what it means to be an eva evangelist. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we were kind of like doing a dual uh, teaching on Philip as the man, but also Philip as the evangelist. But today we're going to talk about this eunuch, because there's something special about him as well. And when we go to Acts the 8th chapter, we begin at verse 26, we're going to find out some things about the eunuch. And why was this person called a eunuch? And why we didn't know his name? Mm -hmm. And why was there emphasis on him being a eunuch? So there's some things that we're going to learn from that, okay? Amen. Now the Ethiopian church mentioned in the Bible was the Ethiopian eunuch that was mentioned in the Bible was a high court official of Candace, who was the queen of Ethiopia. So this was not just a servant that just, you know, followed orders, but he was kind of like, the way I saw it was like um, the prime minister to the queen of England. Mm -hmm. He was a high official ranking uh, officer, okay? He made laws, he oversaw maybe the financial uh, needs of the, a country, but he also probably gave advice to the queen, but he was a very important person. Okay, and he was educated. The reason why we know that he was highly educated is because he was able to read. Okay, so we know that he was highly educated and he was highly regarded in his position. Now, the reason why he was a eunuch, um, the, uh, you know, the definition of a eunuch is a man who has been castrated for the purpose of trusted servitude in a royal household, okay? Uh, if they felt like if this person was a eunuch, if he was castrated, he would not have any kind of desire for the opposite sex or anything, that he would be focused on the service that he was up to perform within the, uh, you know, within the kingdom. He would not be trying to overtake the kingdom or anything else, but he was loyal and dedicated to the service, okay? Amen. A king would often castrate his servants to ensure they would not be tempted to engage in sexual activity, activity with others in the palace, especially the harem. So a lot of these queens, uh, these kings, they had a lot of women, so right. they knew that they could trust these men around their uh, women. Or to prevent them from plotting an overthrow, eunuchs were incapable of setting up a dynasty of their own. Okay, and there was something else about eunuchs in the day, in the Bible. Jesus uh, even talked about that. But we also know that in the Old Testament, if you were a eunuch, you were not permitted to go into the temple. You were not, it's kind of like you were outcast from going into the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. So that set you apart as well. But Jesus had uh, something also to say about eunuchs. He said, but there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb. Mm -hmm. And then there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. So I don't know the case for this particular person. And then there are some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs so that they can work in the kingdom of God, okay? And uh, kind of like, I'm thinking about Paul. Paul might be one that was dedicated to the service of the Lord, so he had no desire to be married, okay? The story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 is a marvelous depiction of God's role in evangelism. You know, uh, sometimes we've been focusing on this little story right here. But God was setting a bigger stage that would be uh, uh, realized in ages to come. So this little act was really breaking down some walls. It was breaking down some barriers. And God, you know one thing that I'm thinking about how God does things in my miraculous ways, but ways that we would never have thought. Who would have thought that Philip would be led by an angel to go to uh, this desert place, and he obeyed. You know, I was thinking about the, the way that God even presented this message to him. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we look for God to, to tell us certain things certain ways, okay? Amen. I remember a time, and I'm going to tell about my angel story, because a lot of people just dismiss that. In fact, I even heard somebody say a couple of weeks ago that they don't believe in all this prophetic and all this stuff, you know. God can use whoever he wants and however he wants to get the message across. Amen. And he does it with clarity if we're willing to listen. Amen. I remember one time I was on, um, I was going through a terrible time, tribulation, all kinds of stuff was coming against me. And I was standing on the corner of 79th and Western. I never will forget it. I never will forget that. 
And this young man, he was about, he looked like he was about 19 or 20 years old. He started talking to me. I'm standing here and he was standing there. And I, he started talking to me and I was ignoring him. <laughs> but when he said something that I knew only God could have told him, then I looked in his face. And his face was like, it was, I, I, there, nobody has a face like that. It was like fine, uh, uh, Peter Corson. No lumps, no bumps, no, no cord, nothing. And I looked at him, and uh, I didn't realize then, you know, that I was looking at the face of an angel. I did not realize it. But then when he began to share some things with me and tell me the things that God, he even showed me some things that's happening to me even right now, okay? And then I wanted to ask him another question, and he disappeared. And I said, my God, I was in the, uh, presence of an angel. The Bible says that don't forget to entertain strangers. But sometimes you are entertaining angels. So we can't really dismiss the way that God will come and bring us a message. And I don't dismiss prophetic words because God was sending me a word. Came me a word today. Because I was contemplating on doing something. And God answered the question right, right today even with the word. So I don't despise the way God will come and bring the message. He doesn't come the way we think. Sometimes we think we negotiate with God and we can tell God, okay, I don't want to go over there to God so I, mean, I ain't got time or whatever, you know. But immediately we see that Philip went to Gaza, which is a very a hot desert place, okay? And he didn't even ask why he was being sent to the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. He just went. And that's in verse 27. But on the road in the chariot was this Ethiopian eunuch. I don't know the race of this person. Some suggest that he was a proselyte. Mm -hmm. And that means somebody that was newly converted to Judaism. So he might have just gotten, uh, uh, became acclimated to Jewish law. So I don't know if he was an African or not. I don't know his race or whatever. The Bible does not clarify that. But he seemed like became um, a Hebrew in the sense, and he was following Jewish laws. And so he was confused because he had not been brought up in the uh, religion. He had not been brought up in the traditions and the ways of the law. So he was seeking some information. So God was seeing his heart. Amen. 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 So we don't know what was going on with him. Okay. The Ethiopian unit uh, um, was reading from the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit of the Lord told Philip to go and join the chariot. Okay, and this was Tanzu, they just say the Spirit. But when Philip drew close, he overheard the unit reading from Isaiah out loud. Okay, he's reading out loud. And the, the Philip asked the Ethiopian whether or not he understood what he was reading. The, Ethiopian reply, how can I know unless somebody guides me? Okay? And that is another role of the evangelist. The evangelist will also teach and make clarity and understanding. And one thing, how can you teach something that you don't know yourself? Amen. 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 So it's very important, that, you know, the role of the evangelist is really to be well versed in, in the Word of God. Because when you're telling people, um, about salvation, when you're going about and you're teaching, you're telling them about, then you need to tell them what the word says. Okay, I can be reminded myself of a time when I was working at a, a center, and most of the people there were, they were homosexuals. Okay, and I knew that the Lord had revealed that to me, and there was a lot of things that they had questions that they did not understand, but the Lord kept saying, "Don't give your opinion." Make sure you give them the word. And one of them asked me a question, well, what does that mean to be saved? Did I say what I felt it meant? No, I had to give the word. The Bible says in John 3.16, uh, the Bible says this. And, and then even when uh, we read some things about their lifestyle, I said, this is what the Lord says. You know, so you have to be well versed in the word of God when you are sharing with somebody. If you don't know. And then you also have to be that example. Remember we talked about the moral character of the deacon as well as the evangelist. In fact, all the roles that we play in the church. We need to follow the moral character, okay, that God has set for us. We've got to be living examples, okay? Now he's going on and say, how can I know unless somebody guides me? 
And then the passage that he was reading was from Isaiah. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth, and his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Well, reading that, if you just write there at that passage, I wouldn't understand that too if I didn't know. Who is he talking about? Who is this lamb that was slain? You know, so that that is very uh, understandable that he did not really know what was going on in this passage. But I thank God because God will send somebody. When you have a sincere heart, God will send somebody that will give you clarity and make it known. Okay, sometimes it might be uh, he will just allow the Holy Spirit to begin to teach you because you be, might be in a situation where you are not in contact with anybody. You could be uh, on death row in prison, okay? But God has a way of giving you the word when your heart is sincere and open. He wanted to know what this meant. And it was a blessing that Philip was there at that time and began, began to show him and share with him about Jesus Christ. And this is the part, you know, like he was uh, looking to be part of the Jewish religion, but God wanted him to be part of the kingdom of salvation. Amen. Amen. He took him from the religious law and took, uh, brought him on into the kingdom of God. You know, amen. Amen. And this is what happened. When he heard the word of Jesus Christ, when he word the, heard, heard the word about salvation, he immediately said, I want to be saved. Amen. His heart was open. His heart was hungry for the word. And not only for that, but he wanted to have that change in his life. Amen. Mm -hmm. And Philip explained to him how the prophecy had been fulfilled by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And as, as Philip explained the gospel, the Ethiopian community believed. And then he, as he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and he learned about baptism, he said, here's the water right here, what is preventing me from being baptized. And the Bible says that when they went down in the water, when they came up, he was not only baptized, and, uh, by the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but he was also filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So he got everything in that one time. Amen. Amen. And then he went on his way. But there's another point that, uh, you know, that I was thinking about in this passage. You see the stage is being set for the gospel to be preached to the uttermost parts of the world. One thing that Jesus has said, go into all the world and preach to all nations and all of that. Well, you know, the disciples of Jesus Christ, even in the book of Acts, had a struggle with that. They were still stuck with the Jews. They did not even go further to even teach the Samaritans. Philip went to the Samaritan church, okay? But now God is also bringing in those people that are considered outcasts. Hmm. When I thought about the eunuch, the eunuch was not supposed to participate in the temple. But God is bringing in, he's doing the work. He's doing a work. He set the stage, but he's doing it in a, a way that we would not have even thought how he is working. You know, but he was saying that I am fulfilling my word. I am going to have this gospel preached to every nation. And so what we see happening here, that God was opening up the door for another country, another continent where people could be saved as well through this incident. Now that incident could be dismissed. And I said, Lord God, how often do we dismiss things? Because we, we see this little bit when God has got a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. He's got a greater picture. He's seeing something that, you know, like I said, the effects of this is still being seen even today. The uh, continent of Africa, people are being saved. And even in the Muslim world, people are being saved because of the gospel. Somebody is willing to go out and risk their life to bring in the gospel as well. There are many elements of God's providence and intervention to the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. The account reveals the importance of these three things. First of all, the importance of knowing the word of God, amen, and the Holy Spirit's leading. Amen. Amen. We must be led by the Spirit. And the need for human evangelism. You know, a lot of people are just happy, and I wouldn't say that, okay. Some people might be just happy with, you know, talking to people that they know, people that they feel comfortable talking to. I don't even know Philip's um, attitude towards this man. You know, he's talking to a eunuch. I don't even know. 
But you know, we have to go and reach those that are, let me say, unreachable or unlikely. You know, God, when God sends us, uh, it might be somebody that we don't feel comfortable talking with, a person of another race, a person who is considered low, amen, a person that we consider uh, not that important, mm -hmm. amen. But God's word has to be revealed through a human evangelist. You know, God don't send angels down to preach to us, okay? He don't do that. He has to use somebody. And God said that one thing about the kingdom, that there are so many people that are not doing the job. And evangelism is very important. All the roles are important. But I'm stressing here the, the role of the evangelist, the heart of the evangelist. And as I was thinking about it, sometimes even as I'm going through and I'm, I'm driving along, I look at somebody and say, Lord, bless that person. Lord, help that person. Help that person so somebody will be able to reach them. I may not be that one, but somebody. Give them somebody that will come and share the gospel. Now, even if they accept it and they don't accept it, but Father, give me that heart of evangelism, the concern, not just about me, myself, and my family. Because oftentimes, well, I want my children to be saved. But I want all people's children to be saved. I want, I, I have a heart for all of them. And the thing that God puts in my mind too that really reminds me and helps me to, to really have that, that urgent um, concern and care is that I, 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 I picture them in hell for eternity. And it's like, it's a heartbreaking situation. I don't want my kids to be lost. I don't want your children to be lost. I don't want to see people lost. They don't realize that they are in bondage. They don't realize, you know, God is saying as the evangelist, he is like setting up as, as a rescue mission. We have to go in. Some people are bound. They're bound in sin and they don't even know how to get out. You know, Jesus gave uh, 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 an example of that when he was given a parable. He was talking about people that were invited to the supper. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's the church folks, you know, they came up with excuses. Or they feel like, uh, well, I'll do this later. Or they feel, you know, uh, somebody even asked me uh, a couple of weeks ago, well, how long are we going to preach to these hard-headed Christians that don't want to do what they need to do? They said, what's going to happen to the church? I said, God, churches don't, don't, don't want to continue to move on, whether they want to come or not. Because what did God say? He said, if they don't want to hear, if they don't want to come and enjoy the supper, if they don't want to come and... and, and and do the work that I called them to do, then you go into the highways and the hedges and all, and you go and you bring in those that are halt and name. Amen. You bring in those that are crippled, those that are bound in sin. And I begin to look up that word halt, that means to stop. Mm -hmm. That means uh, they're standstill, they, they, they're stuck in that place. And so many people are bound in sin. They don't know how to get out. They want to get out, but they don't know how. So we have to come in as a rescue mission. We have to go in and say, Lord God, help us, Father, that we can help them get their deliverance that they need. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord also showed me that the, the move, the shift that's coming in the church and has already begun, he is going to get those people, those people that were drug addicts and, and those people that were outcasts, those people that nobody wanted to talk to, those people that pushed aside, those are going to want, be the ones that he's going to raise up. Because his church is going to go on. Amen. And if we don't get it together as the people of God and to rise up and to be who God has called us to be, then that ship is going to be affecting us. We're going to be left out. We're going to be left behind. But God's church is still going to be going on. Amen. 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 Now the next thing that happened after this, Philip got caught up in the spirit and he went to Azotos, which is the New Testament word. And the ash it was the Old Testament word. And I begin to think about this because this is a something supernatural. Okay? Uh, how can you be in one place and then you zap into another place? Mm -hmm. That sounds like something from the Avengers. Okay? <laughs> I do look at the Avengers. I know them all. Okay? <laughs> in fact, they got the new one called Coke, Coke, whatever that one. Uh, you know? And I'm like, Lord God, how did that happen? But it also reminded me of the supernatural power of God, what he's able to do. And I say, Lord, that help us not to limit your power, because sometimes we do. God is able to do it exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can actually think. You can be in this place today, and he can have you in another country. He can do it. And here's an example of what he did supernaturally. You know, um, 
perhaps uh, didn't have time to go to that other place. That, that, that God just God put him, uh, you know, gave him a spiritual airplane. And he, he was able to go to another place supernaturally. But I'm just seeing God just how He is working out the situation, you know. And a lot of times, even as I read the Word of God, I miss certain things. That look at what God is doing behind the scenes. He's working out something behind the scenes. He's doing something great. He's bringing about a shift. Even in, in the early church, there's a lot of things that's going on. Amen, amen, amen. You know, one of the things that I wanted to talk to us about also, because I had mentioned that, we have uh, these little pamphlets that some people might feel like, well, that's only for the person that has offers of evangelism. I really don't have to tell anybody about the Lord or whatever, you know. They feel like that's not their job, okay. But we all have a mission to reach the lost. Amen. Even if you just say Jesus saved. I can remember when I wasn't saved that I was telling more people about Jesus. The house. Okay, with that. <laughs> but I would always let them know, but you need to believe in God because he can work it out. Okay. But we all have something that we can share with, with somebody to help them come into the kingdom. First the kingdom, and we want to also build up the local church, but God wants us to get people saved, set free, delivered, and help them to know their role so that they can go on and do the work that God has called them to do because God got a purpose and a plan for them as well. Amen. We don't want to get them saved so they can come and sit. Amen. We should not have any selfish motives because we want to see uh, 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 our, our uh, empire grow or whatever. That's not what it's about. But we want to build up the kingdom. We want to see people set free so that they can live the eternal life in heaven. So that they can also live the abundant life while they're here on earth. Right. And so there were some ways that I had written down that you can also do. If you don't have these kind of pamphlets we have here in our church. Or even if you, you know, I remember the time when I would write on my check when I was sitting in my field. I put uh, uh, John 3.16. You know, sometimes people would carry the gospel message on their t-shirts. Sometimes they'll put them on a, a, a thing on their car. Now, if you're doing all that, and I just don't put this plug in there, somebody see you with that thing on and you cussing in the line of getting made at somebody, that's not the example that God wants no. to show. If you are uh, advertising Jesus, then you need to live Jesus and show him no matter where you are. You know, uh, don't get mad that somebody uh, in front of you in a uh, uh, grocery store and they they thought they hit, their card was rejected. And they put a whole lot of stuff on it, you know, and I've seen this happen. And so they ain't going off because of him. Now what example is that? What example is that? So you live an example. First, really live the example. And then there are ways that you can get the gospel. Um, one, one way that when you go to a, a fast food restaurant, you can hand this out to the customers. You can put it on tables in the local post office. Sometimes they're mailing. Somebody just recently put something in my mail that they're doing a prayer walk and they want us to join the fire department and all of them to do the prayer walk. Mm. I don't know the situation here in Chicago, but I know that where I live, they do a lot of work with evangelism. We have prayer with the fire department. We go pray with the police department. We pray with our mayor and all of that, which would be a great thing to do in all cities. You know, our mayor, he professes Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Okay. okay. And then you can pass it out to the students at school after dismissal. They pass it out to everything else. If they're going to be whatever, you know, you can pass these things out. You can even leave them on the elevators or whatever, you know. Add some other people in the theater. So there are many ways. In fact, I've got three pages of it, okay? I'm not going to go through them all. But that's God to show you how you can also do your part in evangelism. And to give you the boldness to speak. Because I know some people have still they're not at that place where they feel comfortable and talking to strangers. But help, ask God to help build you up so that you would have the boldness to speak. And even when they don't accept it. I remember one time when I was speaking to this man and I was asking him about his soul and all that. And he point blank told me he didn't want to go to heaven. Wow. Because there's no sense in him. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I mean, he was serious about it. I said, what do you think they're doing in hell? <laughs> you know, I mean, so there's going to be people that's going to put, uh, you know, they're going to tell you some craziness. But at least I gave him the word. And uh, one day, maybe he might 
Remember that word. It might be sometime when he gets in, in a, a situation and he'll, the Lord will bring it back to him, that word. So sometimes we do not see the fruit of, of the labor. And sometimes the people disrespect. But are you going to get discouraged by that? No. You continue to go on. Continue to do what God has called you to do. Whether they hear you or not. Amen. Amen. And understand too, you know, I really want to stress the importance of being an evangelist. Because we have too few people that really understand that role. How can you win them if you don't go out there and seek them? The Bible says that we have to persuade men, let them know, and show them. Uh, you know, we want our family to say, I have to be an example. I remember when I was kind of living, kind of like shabby. My kids would say, I thought you were saved. Okay, they would come to me like that. They watching you. But now they don't say that. They say, oh, don't say that, mama. You know, I have to live that example. Yeah. She's a woman of God. And her friends know it too. One of the friends say, okay, let her pray because her parents are, are out. But that's an example. I'm not trying to boast and brag on myself. But I say, Lord God, let me live the life so that others can see. Because that's a testimony in itself as well. I'm, I want to bring people to know Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So I want to encourage us today. Now, even through this incident with Philip and the Ethiopian and all of that, and next week we're going to talk about the, the Philip's family because we're going to find out that even his daughters began to prophesy. We're going to find out some other things that he did. So he not only played the role as a deacon and as a, a, a evangelist and a teacher, but later on we're going to find out that he became a pastor. So sometimes you can have multiple roles, okay? But God will equip you to do all the things that he has called you to do. Amen. 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 And to follow his example, his life. Um, so we want to just give God the glory and praise for that. Amen. I pray that, that those few words will be an, an encouragement to us to help us know the seriousness of bringing in the law. Because God is going to do a great work in us if we're obedient to his word. Amen. Amen. Amen.